name. So, Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you for you calling. You call us the bride. Lord, and I'm sorry if there are people that just don't understand how men and women can say you are our bride. Or, excuse me, we are your bride. Because in you, there's no male, no female. Jesus, you tell us we are your loved ones. So Father, now, in this time, Jesus, we give you this time. Not our will, but yours be done. You watch over your word to perform it. And you put a guard over our mouths. And even in our total bumbling failings, you use it for your glory because the foolishness of man is your glory. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, we thank you. We bless you. We give you this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. um, where did your name go? Nam, where'd you go? Nam, I need you. My cameraman. Let, is it on me? Well, no, not you, you do it on the one who's speaking. It was on you. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to give a little introduction, Nam. So go ahead and just, just, or zoom out a little bit. Okay. Is it? Yeah, it's... Hello. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, I asked the Lord for the message this week. And there was nothing. Absolutely nothing. There was uh, no word other than what I just shared. But I got the sense, I had a hunch that I was not to speak other than just introduction. Esther comes to me and she asks if she could share. And I said, honey, that's exactly what you are to do. That's what the Lord told me. So, um, just to, if I could just introduce somewhat. Um, uh, we've been married over a month since yesterday. Uh, it's been amazing. And there's been unity. And it's been miraculous. Because the children went like this. I mean, almost within days, exponential unity. I have never in my life seen anything like this. Given the loss of Leanne and the addition of Esther. It's been miraculous. And I take no credit for it. I mean, I, there have been times I'm on my face weeping because I don't know what to do. But God has done it. And it's not us, but Christ. Not our agenda, but Jesus. So, uh, Esther came. Uh, she grew up Amish. Came from uh, old order Amish. Your stereotypical long beards, horse and buggy. And that's where she came out of. Um, there are, there's a lot in between from how we met through a mutual friend that Leanne and I knew over eight years to us talking, proposing marriage. I mean, just the Lord did it. And um, y'all know my story, most of it, you know. Um, but now, um, Without further ado, I will let Esther share. May God bless you and anoint you in Jesus' name to speak the words that you are given. Um, she is an anointed prophet. The Lord anointed her as a prophet. So, I think that's it. I did not make any notes at all. Um, I, not really by choice, I, I, I didn't have the time, and if I had the time, okay. I, I was not inspired, I, I didn't have anything, 
And so it, what I share is just going to be God. Um, and I had to think of a prophet that I once heard say that when you start speaking, open it up by, I come in the name of the Lord. Because that shows that whatever is, whatever comes forth is from God. And it's not about the, us, me, the, the speaker. Um, when I told Eris about sharing, what I had in mind was two ladies who were here last Shabbat were asking for my testimony and were excited to hear it. And it was Marvin's Bar Yeshua. I didn't want to take away from it. Um, and there, there was no time after the service to share. So what I told Eris was, I said, I feel bad that they came hoping to hear my testimony and, and I never said a word and I feel like we're depriving them. It's not that I, I want to speak so badly, but I, I don't want to deprive them from hearing God's miracle. And so I shared that with Eris and immediately he was like, you can, you can share today, which was not what I had anticipated, um, but I will. Um, like Eris said, I grew up Amish, very religious. Um, I became born again when I was 19 years old. And because of all the religion and oppression, I had a lot of emotional, mental issues when I was 19. That w I would say I'm 30 now, and that was the beginning of going from one counselor to the next, going from medication, one trying me one medication after the other because I was very depressed. I had mood disorders. Um, at first, I was diagnosed with just major depressive disorder, um, and that was an eight nine month ordeal where I went through some major stuff and finally I was I was gone from home and finally they just sent me home as they can't really help me they don't know what to do and so it's been a little bit over 10 years where I went from one diagnosis to the next the next was um, bipolar and the very last one was DID which is a multiple personality disorder and every time I, I was diagnosed, I, it helped me understand what I was going through, but I did not want to um, receive those words or claim that as my identity. But it helped me to work through whatever I was dealing with. Um, in 2019, I, no, it was 2018, I was building my own house and I fell off a ladder and crushed my foot and I was on crutches for two weeks and backing up a little bit, during all that emotional upheaval, I would read my Bible, I was very sincere in whatever I did, but it was, it was a lot of religion. And I would read the Bible, and it would talk about Jesus casting out demons. And I was like, what I'm dealing with is, it's demonic, because if I got, a de if I got a, an attack, I would start thrashing. My, I lost control of my muscles. I would, sometimes I flew off a recliner, where I was reclining or laying down. And all people knew to do, all I knew to do was try supplements, try medication, but always in the back of my mind, I was like, why are we not applying the blood of Jesus? But nobody knew, knew how, no, nobody knew what to do. And in 2018, I became acquainted with a friend who started sharing. She was Amish, she, she still um, looks Amish this, to this day. She started sharing her testimonies of how God healed her from um, trigeminal neurology. Um, am I saying that right? Neuralgia. Neuralgia. Um, and then she had numerous other things that, like a blood clot, um, I think it was a gall, gallbladder stone or kidney stone, I'm not sure. But God healed her miraculously. And she started sharing with me 
how she she claimed the blood of Jesus where it says in Isaiah by his stripes we are healed and also in Luke 10 19 it says nothing shall by any means hurt us and how we can claim that and it was it was like fresh water it's like finally even though you can read in the Bible about miracles finally a, a today miracle it's fresh but it was so new that I could only handle so much and she she started sharing I was like okay stop this is enough for right now let me go home and search my Bible and then I, when I'm ready, I will ask you for more because it was just so huge and so heavy. And she was perfectly fine with that. And I went home and I, I did search, but in the back of my mind, I was, all, I was like, previously, my, my whole life with the uh, mental, emotional condition, I also struggled with always, it seemed like I was a... Um, target child where every year I would have something wrong and it, it was never really that major not not life-threatening but still it, it would lay me up for weeks at a time where I like concussions um, one time I had a facial um, facial fractures where I needed surgery to fix it um, my ankles were sprained a lot just constantly I was attacked and it became a family joke that Esther's hurt again and, and they would laugh about it and finally I, I grew so tired of it and and it, it hurt it hurt me because I felt like I had no power to stop it and so when when my friend started sharing with me about healing I I thought you just wait if I hurt myself again you are going to be called upon to pray for me and we will see if if what you're saying actually works mm -hmm. and so that was in the summer of 2018 and in November it was when I fell and hurt my foot crushed my ankle I was on crutches for two weeks and finally I'm I'm very natural minded I don't like to do medical so I was determined to to heal it with soaks and oils and herbs and I did that for two weeks and finally it was like this is not getting it felt the pain went away, but I couldn't I couldn't bear the weight of my body on my ankle. So finally I I did give up and I went to get an x-ray and just at a chiropractor's office and the chiropractor said, Go to the ER, um, get it get a CAT scan. I'm expecting you'll need surgery because it looks crushed. That was the day before Thanksgiving because so I decided I'll wait until Thanksgiving is over, the weekend is over and then I'll go. And I went home and I told my friend what happened and she, I was with her and I was actually with her in a van with other people and she just instantly laid her hands on my leg and started praying and I was like, wait, this is not how it works. People are going to see you pray because I grew up um, praying out of a prayer book and praying just randomly was like, you don't do that. That's drawing attention to yourself and and people are going to talk bad about you because they're they're afraid of the light they're afraid of the exposure um mm -hmm. so i was like who's watching who's listening but she went right on praying very boldly and i don't think people really heard with the background noises and everything and and i claimed she said you are healed and i claimed that promise and i felt the the some of the pain leave again and I, I kept claiming it until I was, it was that very same night, um, I was with a group of people who had hurt me in my past, and all their accusations against me, um, all the bitterness that I had had in the past against them, came up, and with that, the pain in my foot increased too. Mm -hmm. And I knew in that instant I lost my healing because my heart was turned away from Jesus towards the pain that they had inflicted upon me in the past. And I went home that night and later, I think it was the next day, I called my friend and I said, I told her what happened, I said I, I lost my healing, and I said, could you come on Saturday and pray over my foot? 
She was like, absolutely. And so long story short, she gathered friends. They came to pray over my foot and it was healed. In that same hour, I, I didn't go back to crutches. Um, I could bear the weight of my foot after that. There was um, a span of time where it was stiff and sore and I had to focus on, I am healed. Um, I'm relying on God's strength on the blood of Jesus. And I had to push forward because there, there still was some pain, but I knew that I was healed because I didn't need crutches anymore. And I, had, I didn't do any medical thing at all. Um, so after that, people heard about it because i have been on crutches and they knew I was going to need surgery. And all of a sudden here I was walking and people were wanting explanations and there was no explanation except Jesus healed me. And they didn't know how to handle that. And so I was on a journey of, of finding out more of who this Jesus really is. And with that, my acquaintances from the past, like my family... Um, the gap increased. There was a lot of walls built up, a lot of concerns. They they wanted me to turn back to to stay away from that. They they called it the the um, faith healing stuff. But I knew I had found something that I don't want to let go of, and so I kept pushing forward. And about half a year later. In, in March of 19, 2019, I got baptized by the Holy Spirit, and in May, it, was, it could have been March or April, and in May, the Amish church that I went to, that ministry, they all, um, mostly in one accord, spoke against healing, against, basically against the truth of the Bible, and God had given me a vision previously where he told me that I'm going to leave the Amish. I didn't know when. I was like, God, if it's in 10 years, I'm happy because I didn't want to make the change. But um, that was that, it, it was just a span of a few months from the vision until the day that the ministry um, took a stand against that. And I knew that was the last time I'm in the Amish church. Mm. And so I, that Sunday walking home from church, I knew... There was huge change in my life. I'm not going back. I don't know where I'm going. Um, that next week, I went to a retreat in Georgia called Be in Health. Where, um, I got ministered to, and I felt like I was healed from multiple personality disorder. Um, and I found a church that I, well, the Lord led me to the church that I loved. I loved the people. And I worshiped there for almost two years, not quite. And during that time, I felt like the Lord was calling me for something. And sometimes I would be listening to a speaker or be in worship with God. And, and I just started crying because I felt this huge calling on my life, but I had no idea what it was, except I thought it, it might be... Um, the Lord had previously called me to pursue massage therapy and become a midwife. And so I was focused on that, but every time I moved forward to get into it more, um, the doors would close, and I was left with nothing. And so I would say from the time that I left the Amish up until I got to know Eris, I was in a wilderness of knowing there's a huge calling on my life, but not having a clue what, what it was. And so I kept searching and crying out to God and battling against waves of darkness, just groping, not knowing where I'm going. Um, but knowing that I know in whom I believe and I am not turning back. And there were times when I was like, there, this life of following Jesus is so hard and we're supposed to be representatives of Jesus, but how in the world do I even want to introduce people to Jesus if it's so hard? I grew up in a Bible, religious culture where I learned the Bible, so it wasn't new to me, but just wholeheartedly following Jesus, that was new, and it was like, why do I want to introduce people to it? Because it's so hard. But 
the Bible says straight is the way and narrow straight is the way and narrow is the gate and few there be that find it so accepting Jesus is one thing but following him with dedication is another thing and it's not easy and the only way it's possible is is by his power and by his grace where we are flat on our backs and we don't know where to go but but him and we we put our eyes on him we keep our eyes on him and we follow him and we don't even know all around us there is darkness and we don't like that because we like to we like the tangible stuff we like to know we like to be able to feel to know what we're in and this this Jesus following is not tangible. It's it's by faith, not by sight. Mm. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Mm. So um, in January of this year, my back gave out on me. Um, I couldn't work for six weeks. I so because I couldn't work and I had extremely high expenses. Um, one of my friends, really good friends, they're, they're a family of it's. Um, mom and dad and their four children and they took me in I lived with them for over six weeks they fed me and they gave me shelter and I didn't they didn't want anything for it in return and that is huge if you're used to having to look out for yourself all the time mm -hmm. so they gave me a home um, I had to leave the place where I was living at the time I, I left my job because my back wouldn't pull me up and there I had another healing experience where I just had to wait on the Lord to, to heal my back. And one day it came where I knew that I was healed by the stripes of Jesus. And I, I couldn't even walk upright anymore. My back was so weak, I was slanted forward. And that day I stood up straight. I was, there was strength in my back and I could move forward. It, I still felt it at times, I still had pain at times, but I always went back to, I am healed, and, and God always healed me, resting, um, relying on Him. But I knew getting a job where I had to stand eight hours a day wasn't wise, so God led me to a place where this 87-year-old lady um, needed somebody to stay with her, and I could live there, and she paid me to stay there because I, would, I was taking care of her. Not, she could still take care of her own personal needs, but like cooking, shopping, cleaning, that was on me. So he gave me, God gave me a living, a place to live, and then I started driving Amish, which was also a huge blessing because when I left the Amish, most of the people that I knew shunned me. But I moved to an, another area where people didn't really know me, and well, they just knew me as a driver to haul them from place to place. Therefore, they accepted me, and that was it. Felt good, which I don't follow after what feels good, but it was like a blessing from the Lord that the people who the very same people who sh kicked me out or shunned me were the people that put bread on my table. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was it was a wonderful blessing. But still, there were times when I would be driving people, which didn't take much of me emotionally, physically. I would haul people, I would take them shopping, and I'd sit there for a few hours. I would take um, yarn along and be crocheting for a ministry where they um, put school supplies and hats and sweaters and stuff in little in shoe boxes and sent them overseas to needy people. I'd be doing that, but at the same time, I was just crying. Literally, tears were dripping into the hats and whatever I was crocheting, and I would be glancing out the window. Are my clients coming yet? Because the instant they came, I had to shut off my tears and act like I was normal. <laughs> <laughs> quote unquote normal. <laughs> yeah. The guys were always teasing me about quote unquote. Because <laughs> it's a new um, new way. I I never heard. I've heard people saying that, but not as much as these guys do. <laughs> so um, yeah, I sometimes during the dark or when it was dark and I was driving people. I 
would still be crying because it was just so empty. I couldn't put my heart into anything. And so I thought, well, maybe with my living, the, the living arrangements where I was paid to live there and with driving, it was good money. Maybe that this is where God wants me to start going to school for my massage license. And so I, I prayed into that, um, took small steps to pursue it, just not knowing what I'm supposed to do. And lo and behold, my van breaks down and I'm like, God, why are you doing this to me? Because I need the money to go to school, not, not buy a van. And I had bowed to him because the Bible says, oh no man, anything. I had taken that literally as I don't want to um, be in debt. I don't want to owe, I don't want to do loans or anything. I was like, God, I told you this. I, I felt like this was God's will for me. And here I need a new van and there's no way I can buy a decent van that travels miles and miles per week stay, and stay on top with it. So I, I cried about that and I prayed about it and some of my, and I was, I admit, I confess I was angry. I was like, God, who, who do you think you are? What is this Christian life all about? And some of my friends encouraged me to write down a list of things I want features I want in a car and send it out to my friends and they'll pray over it and I did that um, because I knew there's power in prayer of course and I, I had a van that I thought would would be good I, I just didn't have the money for it and believing in a miracle the very next day my friend Danae texted me and said she will be praying for me and then she sends me a picture of this family of nine boys and said please pray for this family they just lost their wife and mother I'm like okay fine I'll do that and she replies with um, you really do want to be a wife and mom don't you and I said yes but not this and she kept texting me back and forth and I laughed. I, I was on a run. I had an Amish lady at the doctor's office, actually was at a hospital. She wanted to do a CAT scan and I had waiting time. So I was sitting there and texting back and forth and just laughing. I was all by myself in my car. I was like, this is so ridiculous. This, forget it. And so I had some fun with her and then I was like, it'll be out the door. And I said, what actually happened with this lady that she passed away? And she said, um, <coughs> she died of a pituitary tumor and, um, you know, it's a very sad situation. And, and I felt the change in my heart where it was like, oh, this is not a laughing matter after all. I'm not laughing about this situation. And... We, we text back and forth a little bit more and she goes, here's his number. I said, no, I am not calling him. That's not my role as a woman to pursue a man. And so I, I was like, oh, and she replied, he will, he will probably take his time praying about it. So I was like, that's the end of that. And I text her and I said, I'm telling my heart to beat again. There's a song by Danny Gokey that... Um, is named Tell My Heart to Beat Again. And I was like, whew, that was, that was hard, but life, life is normal again. And that happened just within an hour or so. And two hours later, I, I got home and I was doing my stuff and here he calls me and <laughs> I remember one thing, he goes, I have to admit this is very awkward. And I was like, yeah, I get it. <laughs> You're like calling somebody from miles and miles away. You have no idea what you're doing. Um, and I didn't either. But we ended up talking for over two hours. And it was just amazing because I, I was, in the past, I was sexually abused. And I, I felt like I was healed from the initial trauma, but I had this hatred towards men. And then the hatred kind of got better, but I was very awkward around men. 
just didn't care much to be around them. And here I was talking, I mean, it was just a fluent conversation all the way through. There was no, he said it's awkward, but then it really wasn't awkward. It was highly awkward. I mean, not the conversation itself. The conversation itself it, was not, the circumstances it, were yeah. just like, God, what in the world am I doing? What in the world am I doing? Lord, I had already told you, done. I, yeah. I, am, I am raising my kids. I'm going to promote Leanne's legacy. God, you've been faithful. Her life has been an offering. That's what I'm doing. Lord, I'm, I'm a single dad. I don't care. You know, finally, he, he told me strongly, why are you refusing what I'm giving you? I said, okay, all right, I receive it. And, uh, I mean, within, I mean, she did something in my spirit that just was like, whoa, like, just like fire. I'm like, glory to God. I was like, I said, okay, Lord, this is like too much. I don't know if I can handle this. And uh, I called her back and I said, we're going to do this right. I've messed up a lot in my life. You had told me before we ended our phone call, you had told me pray about it and call me back if you want me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then I was like, okay, that's not right. Okay, let me call back. And, and, and I said, listen, let's get... So, the person... So, I had a... Okay. Okay. It, the Lord told me on a Saturday, I'm not going to show you this list, but uh, there were, let's see here, 57, so the list is, is here, you know, 57 things. And, uh, and, oh, you need to explain what, 57 things. Are 57 things, the Lord said, write down a list of qualities for a godly wife and mother. And I said, okay, I just started going down the list. And I said, here you go, Lord. That's what you told me to write down. And he said, and, and there, was, there was peace. The kids told me, Daddy, is that Shabbat? Daddy, can we have another mommy? I mean, I know she'll never replace Leanne, never replace mommy, but we're lonely. I said, look, you got to pray. I got nothing to do with this. And I said, this is what the Lord gave me. He said, Daddy, I, we'll pray with you on this list. Who in the world is going to like this? I mean, it's going to fit that. That's going to take a miracle. I sent it to some friends to pray. Uh, Danae, our friend Danae, was one of them. Now, Leanne and I have known Danae for eight years uh, when we met in Ohio, and we've just kept up. Sweet lady. And then uh, she tells me, I get this text after I laid... There was a, a heart affection, and I laid it down on the altar. I said, Lord, it's yours. It was on a Wednesday. And the moment I laid it down, I get a call or a text from Janae saying, you need to talk to Esther Miller. I said, who? Like to myself, like, who? Esther Miller, here. Here's her number. Maybe it's a possibility. I mean, she kept pushing the issue. And the Lord always told me from eighth of a tank, said, if you are given a number, if you're given a lead, you don't know what it'll lead to, at the very least, you talk to them about Jesus and take it. You know, I've spoken with scammers. I've spoken with all sorts of people. I've seen people come to Christ in the weirdest of ways. So you don't know what it'll lead to. I was like, okay, sure, fine. And uh, I'm like, and then I'm thinking, possibility for what? And uh, I later found out that Danae gave Esther the list. And I chided her for that. I said, you're not supposed to give her the list. I said, it was for prayer. She said, I couldn't. She said, I'm sorry. The Holy Spirit just pressed me so hard, I couldn't move and I had to give it to her. I said, you don't need a van. You need a man here. And it was only half the list. She only gave her 37 things, and I had 57 things. And then after, after we were married, and I said, well, there's actually 57 things. It's like, well, it's too late now. <laughs> Not that I was going to take her back. But as we've gone along, she still filled every one of them. The rest of the 20. Oh, there was one, though, that, I, that she, Danae, I, yeah, I forgot to say that. She texted me the list of requirements, and there was one I said, I'm sorry, I don't have a closed womb, and I'm not 
I'm not doing anything to get to that point. So that was another thing. I was like, I'm done. If he's he has a mind like that, who knows how he's going to treat me. And all the while, God was working on me. And I, I mean, just this burning worse than any indigestion I've ever had. And he said, you need to call this mutual pastor that I said, look, I want oversight because I'm human. I need Jesus and I can't see. And I need them to pray over this because I'm not outside of authority. And they prayed over it and they, they told, you know, chill or whatever. And, uh, and the Lord just kept saying, son, I never told you to stop having children. Why are you going to refuse what I bless? And I had to repent. I want, you know, I listened to my mom's advice saying, oh, you're, you don't need any more children, which my children are wonderful. But that's not what the Lord said. And I had to repent. I said, Lord, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. That was flesh. And it was like an urging. I have to call so-and-so. The, the pastor. And I called him and I said, I need to tell you now, I repent. It was a flesh matter about children. I want what God gives. I want children. I don't care. I'm sorry. He said, I'm glad you, an you answered that way because that was our only hang up. We can move forward. So, yes, thank you, Jesus. And then the, the indigestion went away. Uh, and, uh, and it was confirmed, you know. And, uh, and uh, it was, uh, go ahead, I, I don't know what else to say. So after we were, we decided to have this pastor and his wife kind of like spiritual parents for us, he talked with them and I went to their house and talked with them and I decided I don't want any more contact with Eric until he spoke with two, of, two people in my life, two guys that were like spiritual fathers to me. So I, I want them to feel him out because I don't want to become involved with him emotionally and then he's a quack and a nerd, I said. Oh, I, I still have a nerd, yeah. so. <laughs> a good nerd. Um, and they, I waited for almost a week. I was on my face, fasting and praying, no contact with Eris, waiting for these two guys to come back to me about what they thought. They both responded with the Lord told them to not get involved with this situation. So I called the couple that was um, standing be be in between for us, and I said, you can call Eric and tell him he can go ahead and call me. Um, I know what the Lord wants me to do, and these men are not willing to take a part in it. And he called me that very night, just like a few hours later. This was so weird. I remember I was we we had just finished lunch and uh, I was just so distraught. For no, I'm like I don't know Lord why I'm so distraught. I couldn't handle it. I mean there was nothing externally happening in the house. Nothing going on. Um, but I told him I was about ready to pull my hair. Like something like you ever get that like you feel like every molecule in your body is just. Just, uh, just, and I'm like, guys, I've got to get out of here. I said, I love you. Clean up. I'm going for a walk. I'm going to go talk to Jesus. And I did. And I fell on my face. And there's a ditch at the very end of my property. I fell into the ditch. And I'm screaming, oh, God, I don't know what to do. I'm alone. Oh, God, you've got to protect me. You've got to take care of me. I don't, I'm just lost. What is wrong with me? And just quietly, quietly ask how Esther is doing. And I just kept yakking. But Jesus, I've, I heard that. I'm just sobbing. You've got to guide me. I'm so, like, clueless. Throughout this whole ordeal, Isaiah 30, verse 21, you'll hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way I walk in. Leave the dead to bury their dead. Um, realizing that there were those who were, who were flat out, they're not where they ought be, and Jesus is trying to get them to follow him, and they are so wanting to focus that which is temporal, and they're not wanting to, they say, you know, uh, well, let me go first bury my father. Let me go get, let me go finish things with my family. Eighth of a tank, where we, uh, 
were tempted to go back and say goodbye to everybody, like Laban and Jacob. Maybe I would have, I would have given you a kiss to you and given you a party. Whatever. No, you wouldn't. You would keep me back from the Lord. And that's what was happening. And that's what we were hearing on the backside. And uh, the Lord kept saying, ask how Esther is doing. And I'm like, what? Ask how Esther is doing. But Lord, I'm not supposed to. Are you going to ask how Esther's doing? Okay. And I sent a message to Alvin, uh, 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 the pastor and his wife. And I said, how is Esther doing? Because I'm just this, I'm just really concerned for some reason. I don't know why. And uh, I sent a, they sent, they said, well, we'll find out. I get a note back uh, about an hour later. She says, you know, the, the couple said, well, you can ask her yourself. Give her a call. You have a go ahead. And I did. Uh, she was finishing a run. And I talked to her. And it was one of those things. One of my kids earlier on, I mean, and, and God opened the door, said, we want to visit. And, and, and I said, you know, pray about it. And I said, because uh, I was uh, provided resources. I'm like, Lord, what do you want me to do with this stuff? Uh, so when, they, when, when I got the call from the pastor and his wife, he said, uh, pray about when you should come. I'm coming next week. Well, you should take some time. Nope. I already know exactly what to do. From this date to this date, boom, I'm there. And God provided for Ramon to come with. Uh, and, uh, and I said, I know exactly what to do. I walk in the house. One of the kids said, Daddy, are you going to go to Ohio and pick up Esther and bring her back? I ran to my room. No! Oh, God, no, this is nuts. No, 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 no. That's not my plan. He said, what if it's mine? Oh, Jesus. Oh, God, what are you doing to me? This is going to kill me. That's cruel. And he's like, that's the point. I don't want your flesh. I want you with me. Oh, you know what it's going to do, Lord. He said, just trust me. You will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way walk in. Okay. So that, that happened before this whole interlude of me crying out to the Lord. I go to Maple Island Park. I'm walking around, and this thing just bubbling up, bubbling up, bubbling up. So I'm walking, I have my hands free, bubbling up. I'm like, oh, okay. That's just going to sound really nuts. But I can't go on. I cannot go on. I got to speak, otherwise I'm going to die. And she's like, go ahead. If I asked you to come marry me and come with me to Minnesota, what would you say? Yes. I was like, what? You're not supposed to say that. Did you just, what? You just said yes? Yes. Like 100%. Yes. Really? Yes. You sure? Yes. 110%. How about I buy your plane ticket? We'll leave Sunday. She's like, yes. Okay. And I kid you not. Okay, I know it looks dramatic, but I literally did that. Right there in the park, people must have thought I was nuts. Anybody who's known, who's known me thinks I'm nuts. What is... Okay, so... First... Was it 1 Corinthians 5 or 2 Corinthians 5? Y'all are going to get some word. She needs to finish her story, too. Oh, she'll finish it. <laughs> yeah, she, yeah, but this, you guys got to get some word. Meet in due season. Come on. Can I get a witness here? Amen. That's it. Okay. So, 2 Corinthians 6. So, we are always confident and know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. But we walk by faith. Exactly how you started. Not by sight. And we are confident and satisfied to be out of the body and at home with the Lord. Therefore, whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to be pleasing to Him. For we must all appear before the tribunal of Christ so that each may be repaid for what He has done in the body, whether good or worthless. Now, if you skip down, verse 13, if we are out of our mind, it is for God. If we have a sound mind, it is for you. So that, that constraining that, oh! For if, or for Christ's love compels us, or rather, the love of Christ impels or controls us since we have reached this conclusion. If one died for all, then all died, and he died for all, so that those who should live, who live, should no longer 
live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. I gave my life completely to Jesus. And the Holy Spirit will take that surrender and control you. And it's not, oh, we're an automaton and a robot. No. If you surrender your vessel completely, guess what? God's going to use it. That's what he did with me. And after she said yes and things were done, great. I was up and moving and walking. And I'm like, okay. That indigestion was the Holy Spirit just impelling me. And 1 Corinthians 4 says, I'm not aware of any judgment against me. I've heard people say, um, we must judge with righteous judgment. I'm sorry, that's a misuse of the scripture because that deals with judging fruit of the flesh. But Paul says, I don't even judge myself and each one should reserve judgment until there's fruit. So that was the next leg that we went into. Let's, let's, go ahead. Yeah, so I knew what my answer was for Eris. I just didn't know was, it, was his proposal going to come in the next month, next six months, or the next year. But I knew and I was ready. And so when I was done with um, the hauling that I had been doing, and back home, he called me again, and that's when he proposed. And yes, my first answer was right off the bat, yes. But then he, when he was like, can I buy a plane ticket? I was, oh my goodness, what did I just say? I mean, I was thinking of all the different things, like packing up my stuff, moving out of that elderly lady's house. How in the world am I going to get everything ready? Which God had told me that I would take care of the details. And then I was, and, and Eris was like, okay, you said yes, here's the test. Oh, okay, yes, you can buy a plane ticket. I'll, I'll go with you. And so after that, that was on a Tuesday. And by the next Wednesday, we were married. And in that, a little bit over a week, I, the Lord had given me a vision of, I call it a glory dress that I wanted to sew. I, I grew up sewing my own dresses. And so <clears throat> because of the short span of time, and I wanted a practical dress um, because I, I didn't want to spend a lot and I didn't really want to keep anything that I couldn't um, wear later on. Um, so I, I made the dress and had to rearrange, like arrange all my, getting rid of my car that was no longer in good working condition, um, pack up my stuff, yeah, just getting everything done. Plus, the hardest thing was getting phone calls of people and making phone calls to people that I was really close with and saying, hey, this guy from Minnesota called me, proposed to me, I'm getting married next week. And the onslaught of disapproval and persecution, people that I was really, really close to were not with me. And some were like, if you're gonna act like that, we're not gonna come to your wedding. Finally, I was so exhausted of swimming upstream, trying, I mean, I didn't even try to convince people anymore, but they were like, surely you wanna have a special wedding with a wedding dress. Esther, what about your cake? Oh who cares? That's yeah. the flowers. That's the least bit of my concern. Those worldly things don't mean a thing to me. I just want Jesus. I just want what he wants. And so, yeah, it was so exhausting. And then um, we, we text during the day mostly. And then at night he called me and we talked way late into the night. Because that was the only time we had to talk. Um, by Tuesday, I was exhausted with everything that was going on. And I that was the last day where I moved my stuff out into storage. I did it mostly, pretty much everything by myself. And on my way from my place, I loaded my van, my car with all my things and took it to the storage place, which was about an hour away. And on the road to that place, um, I get this phone call from the people, from the couple that was being our spiritual parent. And she said, I mean, this was the day before we were planning on getting married. And she was like, this friend called me and said, Eris is so and so and so and so. He was controlling. That cancer comes from oppression. Leanne died from cancer and it was because he was 
forceful, he was controlling, he was narcissist. A, yeah, he was not a good husband. Not loving his wife. And I was just I was in silence. And I think this lady thought it would maybe rile me up or disturb me where I'd lose it. And I I I was just quiet. I was like in the world, I I am following God. This can't be God if if this is the truth. And so I was like, okay, fine. Thanks for letting me know. I'll call Eris, and and this will be the final test because I was like, if this yeah. is true and the truth is coming out, he will be angry. And I called him, and I I told him I, I'm sorry, but I I have to say this, and I I repeated what what this lady said. And he just broke down and cried. I was like, this is the biggest lie and attack ever. Mm. So he he cried and he um, tried to explain where he's coming from. And then he got Jen on the phone, Ramon's wife, and as a witness to what he was saying. And we, we spent time praying about it. And I knew, which I had known before, but more than ever, I knew that this is from the Lord. Um, those are lies, and what I am doing is what God is asking me to do. The uh, I'm sorry, baby. Go ahead. Um, we hung up, and I I had my van to unload, and I had two more people to meet to like finish up things because I was leaving for Minnesota in that week, which getting married the very next day. So the next place I went to, um, same thing, like Esther, we're not even going to come to your wedding because this is so off the wall. You're not listening to the counsel of many. Um, and they too were like, what about your wedding? You can't think of it. You'll never have your very own wedding where all the, your friends can come. We want to come and rejoice with you. I was like, you may. You may come rejoice with me. This is just not the standard wedding that we're all used to. Where is our faith? And I, I told them about Isaac and Rebecca, but otherwise I was just um, mostly quiet and let them talk. And and I left. They, they weren't angry at me. I wasn't angry either. But... They, they told me they're not coming to the wedding. Um, and then I, I had one more stop to make. I did. They, those people were, they had changed their mind. They were super good friends. Actually, the people that I had lived with for six weeks this January. And this lady, my sister in Christ, she opened up and she started sharing why they were so against our plans. And it was because... Right at the time that Eris called me, they knew of three other ladies who were trapped by guys who had started just randomly calling them and um, emotionally got them all wrapped up and, and they said they need to, they're going to come for them. Um, they were in the process of buying a plane ticket and then all of a sudden they were out of money and they needed money to buy the plane ticket. Just um, manipulation. And they were like, do we not do we have proof that this is not the same thing you are like a daughter to us we are not just going to let you go but then i forget what happened that they realized that this is different this is the this children is. it was the children My oh children. yeah um because he listens to his children it's, 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 is that that's what you told me is okay. that um, you, you were sharing about yeah. me talking about everything to my children yeah. and how um, the kids started saying, Daddy, this is so ridiculous, this has to be God, and that uh, he got his children involved to pray, and, and because you shared that with them, they're like, yes, okay, this is different. Yeah. I think it's what you told me. So before I left that night, they gave their complete blessing, full blessing. They couldn't come to the wedding, but I knew that they, they blessed me, which felt really good. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. So yeah, Wednesday came. Um, we met at the Bridge of Dreams for the first time. And now when I, when I look at him, sometimes I'm reminded of that first meeting where it was just almost like the time stopped. 
It's like walking into your future that you have no idea about, but full faith and just the awe and holiness of the moment. When you're walking with the Lord, you never get bored. Amen. And uh, that's, you know, I just want to share with that person who attacked just verbally. It was just, for one, from a technical perspective, a pituitary tumor, 99.9% .9 is not cancerous. Oh, yeah. And this one was not cancerous. It was a functional adenoma that causes Cushing's disease, okay? So it was not cancer, not a cancer at all. So, <clears throat> and Leanne had one before that was also not cancerous. Mm -hmm. So, um, and for my mom being scared of, no, because if, 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 if she gets pregnant, she'll have a brain tumor like Leanne did. And I said, Ema, you don't know that. In fact, they don't know what caused, to this day, doctors don't know what caused pituitary tumors. Why? Because it's Tuesday. I don't know. They, they really don't know. They, they still don't know. Uh, so, but regarding the, the one person, when Esther hit me with that bombshell, that just, it was like, throughout the whole time, it's like the devil was gunning for us. And it's like I heard, and the devil just looking at me, you stinking piece of trash. And, and I heard it, and it was like, huh? Oh, I was like, I couldn't take any more. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And I fell on my face right behind the white building. I said, oh, God, I can't take this. I can't take this. And just quietly, it was a test to me where God said, are you going to bless your enemies? Mm -hmm. And I said, Lord, I give you my pain. Bless that person. Mm -hmm. Jesus, I love you, and I love this person. Bless them. They don't know what they're doing. And when I did that, the pain literally was gone. And I was so full of love. And on her side, she said, I am so sorry. I did not want to tell you. I am so sorry. Please forgive me. I am so sorry. I, I mean, just on and on. I said, it is not your fault. God was testing me. Because... If you see that I get defensive over this, then what sort of picture am I, uh, am I of Jesus to you? The scripture says I'm to look like Christ to you. And we talked about the whole big wedding. She's like, do you want flowers and fruit and fluff and stuff? I said, no, I don't want it. No, I had a big wedding. It was great. It was wonderful. I don't want it. I don't want it. I'm tired of it. I, I, I don't want fluff. I, I'm, I'm a simple man. I want my brother Ramon with me, vows before the Lord, you and me, and that's what I want. I want Jesus. And we got it. It was wonderful. It was beautiful. She asked me to baptize her, and I did. And the Lord said to me, you're going to anoint her as a prophet. And I did, in front of everybody. And the message was, behold the work of the Lord. If you're here, it's because you want Jesus. And that's what I preached that day. I said, if you are here at this wedding, if you are witnessing this miracle, it's because you want Jesus and you're not looking back. And you say, you know what? I want something more. And you know what? You're going to get something more. You will get the Lord. Those who seek me, what does the scripture say? If you seek me, you will find me. And, and I believe they did. I, it's, are you done? I, I think that was it. We need to wrap this up, but here's another thing that I want to share. It's the, the same day, the first day that you called me, you started sharing freedom and truth from the Word of God. And I had been seeing a counselor up until we met who I was just pushing through so much darkness and pain and not having answers. And the very day you called me, you started ministering to me. And that's where a lot of people were also very skeptical because of all the emotional issues I had. And when we started calling regularly then, he kept ministering to me after we got married, even the first few days at the motel. We broke through serious 
darkness and I would say the root issue of it was still unforgiveness towards my perpetrator and mm. anger and I went to the place where I always went to with my counselor of just against a brick wall and there was no there was no way through and finally the Lord told told Eris it's unforgiveness towards my perpetrator and he, er, the Lord showed Eris how to lead me through that. With we were working through the steps of freedom in Christ by Neil, um, Neil T. Anderson. Neil T. Anderson. So even when when the people were skeptical about it, I couldn't freely share with them how Eris is ministering to me because that's unheard of. It it just doesn't happen often. Often it happens where the girl is infatuated with. Her pursuer and it's fluff and I knew in my heart this is not fluff this is the truth of the gospel and I want it but I had to be very careful how I stated that because people had their guards up you're just desperate for a man and it wasn't the truth but that's where people went to so with all the emotional issues I've had it's not that they just boom went away but God has given this man some serious teaching and help and the leading of the Holy Spirit where he could help me through places that nobody else could. I will say this in, in, in wrapping up. Um, I know people are getting antsy. <sighs> Please, you, you have blessed me. I received the blessing. All credit goes to Jesus Christ. All of it, every single bit of it. I'm a broken man. More today because my first wife is gone. She's brought me to, in fact, she, before her, you would have married a mess. If, if, if you were my first, woo. So, she invested in me, and that's what you're seeing. I'll say this. In speaking to you all, I'll never forget, I remember sharing with you something on the first call. And you were saying, I want to tell you, stop, stop, stop. And, and you were telling me that. And in, in, it's funny because Leanne would tell me something similar. And I'd be like, okay, so yeah, we're done. So now, how do we get forward? She's like, I can't even break up with you. Right? She, like, she would tell, Leanne would tell me, she said to me, you know, I don't, you know you're a great guy and all, but... I don't think I'm going to be able to satisfy your needs because I was real affectionate with her. And something in me said, oh, don't give up, don't quit. And something in me was saying that. And I was like, well, I'm compelled to make it work. She's like, oh, okay. You want to go to my family reunion then? I was like, sure. And I met everybody knowing the man and her family, which was great. Um, we're in the paper actually from that. Um, so a similar thing happened where Esther said something Okay, this is too much. I don't want you to talk anymore. And I said, and I was like, Lord, what do I do? And he reminded me of the training of Neil T. Anderson to say, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. Now, what does your heart want to do? And she said, I want to go deeper in this. So those words that you spoke, they're not from you, are they? No, I don't agree with that. But my heart wants death. I want, my heart wants you to keep going. I said, okay, great, thank you for sharing. Let's keep going. And we did, and I thought. But I said, you have to go slow enough. And I was like, that's, that's it. He's not gonna be okay with that. We're done. Because, you know, going slow might mean, he might think I just want what my flesh wants. And he's like starting to praise God and say, Oh, this is so good. This is exactly what Leanne has tried to teach me to be patient and to be slow enough. On me. Okay, then. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was. Because at first she was like, uh, she said to me, So let me guess. Your next words are, You're going to leave me. You're, you've had enough with me. I said, You don't understand. And I started crying. God has been working on me patience and to be slow. And I shared how Leanne struggled with the last bit of her life in walking. And I had to learn to walk in pace with her, slowly, physically and spiritually, like emotionally. Yeah. And it was a, it was a type and a shadow. And I said, um, this is teaching me to walk slow with you too. I praise God. And she says, 
What if I can't move fast enough? Are you gonna leave? You're just gonna be like one of these other guys that I'm too slow for you, dude. You're just gonna walk off. And I said, and that would make me a lousy Christian because in the very least, my Christian duty is to encourage you in the body of Christ until God takes you away. I am not leaving. And if you're my wife, I most certainly will. And I will take whatever time is necessary. Jesus Christ, this is how in 1 John 3, 16, this is how we know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. We must also do the same. Guys, greater level of faith and trust is coming. A greater, I will share this, that a greater level of faith and trust is being asked of our family. I ask for your prayers. There are more open doors in the sense of uh, going to the Florida prisons to preach. Uh, please be in prayer for that. Uh, Eighth of a Tank is going to be published. I just finished the bulk of the editing. It's, it's done. Um, there's some folks that need to put in some material. And um, I will say this, and I'm sorry. I've had people accuse me of being narcissistic. I'll say this, there is truth to that. Absolutely there is truth, because I was one. Before Jesus, I was probably one of the worst narcissists. Getting what I want. Mm. Now, I will get what I want, because it's not my mm. wants, it's the wants of Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's his desires, mm -hmm. and I'll stop at nothing to make sure his kingdom is made known. Amen. And if it means the death of my body, of my heart, whatever it costs. If that makes me a narcissist, fine. Because it's not my will. It's Christ Jesus in me. The only thing, the only benefit, the only accolade, the only gain I'm getting from this is persecution. Amen. It's the cross. It's insults. I got reported on by social services saying, you left your children away for 24 hours, which was not true. I had somebody at the home at least 12 hours a day. For three days, somebody was sleeping, an adult was sleeping, a nurse was sleeping in my house for three days, watching the kids. A total false accusation. That's what you get for following Jesus. But what I will say afterwards, I don't want to paint a dismal picture. In following Jesus, you see him work. Amen. You see impossibilities occur. Amen. You see lives change. You see crippled. You see the weak become preachers. Amen. We had an anointing when we were there. A person who was so shy. The words that were spoken of her preaching to her family. She started weeping. She desired to preach the gospel. She didn't know how to go from here to there. And she was called of God, anointed as an evangelist. And she's like, oh God, I can't do this. Collapse, like puddle, jello. And she was anointed because God raised her up. And she is going to preach. I let the fire fall. Somebody was anointed as an evangelist after years of abuse from a very troubling marriage. Horrible situation. God anointed her. And she said, For six years, this is a buildup of everything the Lord has done. And I've never felt such a tangible presence of heat from the head all the way down to my toes. Guys, God is moving. Are you ready? Are you ready to stand in the fire? Or do you just want to be warmed by it? <laughs> Um, would you like to pray or do you want me to pray? Sure, okay. Go for it. Lord, thank you for this time of sharing. Lord, I pray that your kingdom would be glorified and magnified through this story that you have given to us. Lord, thank you for the family that you have given to me. Thank you that Eris has proved himself faithful and you are faithful, Lord, above all. Thank you for the nine boys that I get to mother. Thank you for what you have done in their lives, Lord. Thank you for the time of gathering and fellowship that you have given on, given to us on this day. Lord, I pray your blessing on each and every one of that is listening and the people that are here. 
Lord, just let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, I thank you for this word. Jesus, I pray that your words go viral. Amen. Your words go viral. Yeah. That, ooh! Um, Leolam kivod malchuto. May all of the world be filled of your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, one last thing, one last thing. Uh, did you stop it? Uh, to those who don't know, we are pregnant. Yay! Yay! And God has given a name. Can I share the name? Sure. Naomi Esther. Ooh. We, uh, in fact, I spoke with a dear friend in Ohio who knows Esther. Uh, she said, so who did you get married to? You remember so-and-so? I remember her. That's my wife. She's like, wow! And she was so excited. She said, I had a vision. She's like, I didn't know you married her, but I had a vision. You marrying a very thin lady holding a daughter. And I said, well, that's sort of funny. And, and I told her about the word that was given. And if it's a boy, great. We know the Lord gives us names, and it's a name for this, his child. The child is his, not ours. So please be praying, because uh, I will have nine children that will be snipers over their sister. <laughs> I say that tongue in cheek. No, there's no threats or anything like that. But uh, be praying. So a uh, lot more changes coming up. Pray for Leanne's biography to be coming out. Uh, that's going to be a big undertaking. So uh, we love you. God bless you. Let me let me say this. Here. Yep. Um, I want to do a shout out to the boys, the nine boys here. They are amazing. There's been growing pains of getting adjusted, but the the manly part of them is super manly. And I have said, let all things be done decently and in order. Because there have been times in this house when it has not been like that. But they know how. And I am proud of them. I am as proud of them as it would be of my own biological sons. They are super amazing and they have a wonderful daddy. Praise, Praise God. God. It's Praise about him. Amen. Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Okay.